Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Extraordinary Technology Conference 2017. This is the breakout workshop session, and today it is my pleasure to introduce to you David Garraway. David Garraway was born in New York, New York. Um, he visited the mystery spot in Santa Clara at, at a point in his life, and it opened the door to endless wonder. He works to detect the and understand the essential nature of ether. At present, he hails from Los Angeles, California, but he's moving to the great state of Colorado. So I'd like you to welcome David Garraway. Thank you, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm back for the third time at Tesla Tech. And uh, wow, it's really something to be back here. The first two times I was here, I presented Implosive Vortex Dynamics. And I only had an hour to do so. I made a big mistake, and I tried to put too much in too little time. So consequently, I had to gloss over a lot of the details of um, the dynamics of the implosion of the ether, which occurs um, as we sit here. We're being forced down to the Earth right now by the implosion of the ether. Gravity is an effect, not a force. You're being pushed down to the Earth, not pulled. And uh, I described this fairly well, but I had to... Um, skip over a lot of the details concerning some of the coils I've constructed which detect the ether waves and um, allow people to actually feel the presence of fields around things which the ether causes. There are fields around all objects of this imploding ether. Um, there's a Lagrange point between us and the moon and there's also a Lagrange point between this object and this object. The gravity of this object is stronger on this side of the point and the gravity of this object is stronger on this side of the point. So thus, there's a field around all objects. I call it the Lagrange field, or Lagrange envelope. And you can't detect it unless you have one of these coils. This will actually detect where the ether waves start going this way and where the imploding ether waves start going this way. Originally, what got me started, he introduced me as um, somebody that was um, going to the mystery spot from Santa Clara. Actually, the mystery spot's in Santa Cruz, California. I went there when I was 18, and um, I thought I really understood relativity. People told me, uh, you know, this mystery spot is a gravitational vortex. It's very strange. Uh, balls roll uphill and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, sure, right. Einstein's wrong, right? Okay, I, I believe it. Well, I got there, and sure enough, it was a gravitational vortex. Stuff was rolling uphill and um, all kinds of strange effects. Uh, you know, they have a board where one person stands like this, and then you change spots, and you're like three feet apart, and you're eye to eye, and you change positions, and suddenly you're looking over that person's head. And you change back, and you're eye to eye again. So the space-time in that particular area, it's about 150-foot radius on the side of a hill outside of Santa Cruz, the space-time is actually warped there. And uh, it defies Einstein's physics completely. Einstein went there once, and he left laughing, because he knew his work was incomplete. And it even has a little placard about his unified field theory on the side of um, the entryway. It's actually a, a tourist trap now. And I knew something was up, and I went there, and I saw the faces of the tourists coming down the path. And they were all excited and, and aghast at what they had seen at the spot. So ever since then, I've been fascinated because I felt like I had been lied to about, you know, the nature of reality and what the mystery spot, you know, showed me was that Einstein was incomplete and that modern science really didn't know what they were talking about. So I went back and studied uh, the ether physics of the Greeks. They were into the ether. And I looked at what they proposed it to be. And then I wondered why Michelson and Morley were incomplete in their uh, determination of the ether. Which brings me to uh, what I'll do is review my presentation of 2013. And you can see some of the, um, the conclusions that I drew, if I can come up with the clicker here. Where did I put that? Hmm, how embarrassing. <laughs> Hold on. John, you got the clicker? Pardon? The clicker. Hello, hello? Okay, good. 
Okay, sorry about that. I shouldn't have started the uh, show so early. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I guess it, it allowed me to get a little warmed up, and I'm not as nervous as I usually am here. So, um, anyway, I went to the mystery spot, and I saw all these strange effects, space-time being warped, and uh, people changing positions, and changing height, and just a few feet. But the thing that clued me in as to the nature of the ether was that the Coriolis effect is reversed in the mystery spot. As you might know, water goes down the drain in the northern hemisphere in a right-handed spiral, and in the southern hemisphere it goes down the drain in a left-handed spiral. And they tell us this is caused by the rotation of the Earth. Well, in the mystery spot, the Coriolis effect is reversed. Water goes down the drain in a left-handed spiral. So this led me to the conclusion that gravity, with this anti-gravity force is coming out of the ground at the mystery spot, Gravity also has torque to it associated with it, um, as well as push and pull. There is anti-gravity. And Einstein says there is no such thing as anti-gravity. So, but I experienced it, so I knew there was, and I realized there's a left-handed torque associated with gravity. So this led me to the conclusion that indeed, uh, modern physics is wrong. The universe is not expanding. We're actually, it did expand a long, long time ago, about 35 billion years ago. Our universe expanded, but there was no matter in it. It was just hot ether, if you will, hot space-time. It reached its maximum size, and then it began to implode. And this is when the ether waves formed, the vortexes of spiraling waves. Uh, there's about 20 of them, a dodecahedron of these spiraling waves to the uh, imploding universe. And they started to form as the universe cooled and began to implode. And this is what gravity is, is the implosive force of the uh, ether. And the funny thing about the ether is it's a de-astrofractating function. I'll get to that later, but it doesn't implode to one point. It implodes to every one thing. So every atom has its own implosion going on around it. Uh, there's maybe only 20 vortexes of imploding energy around the Earth, but as they get closer to the ground, those spirals break up into smaller and smaller venues and smaller spirals. So one big spiral breaks up into smaller spirals, that breaks up in even smaller spirals, and it goes all the way down to the nuclear level. And uh, that's why our universe only looks to be about half as old as it is, because we can only see back to the point where it began to implode. And all matter is really the function of this implosion. The implosion causes electrons to form, they're little eddies in time space, and consequently you get hydrogen atoms, and that causes stars to form. And, of course, we know that elements form in the heart of stars, and uh, higher and higher elements form, and then life itself begins. And uh, right now we're at the stage where complex life is coming into being. And this is why Michelson and Morley blew it when they were looking for the ether. They made a false assumption. They figured the ether was a uniform substance that was uh, permeating space, and that um, it was only flowing in one direction relative to the Earth, in our solar system. So at one time a year, the Earth would be going through it in one direction, and a light beam from point A to point B would take 10 seconds, say, and 180 degrees out of phase, six months later, the Earth would be going the other direction through the ether, and a light beam would take, say, eight seconds, because it'd be going uphill against the ether this time. But they could find no difference, no matter how they oriented their machine, a light ray always took the same amount of time to go to the mirror and bounce back. So they concluded, well, there is no ether. And that was an erroneous conclusion because the ether is not a uh, consistent flowing river in space. It's a de-astrofractating function, and everything has its own envelope of imploding ether around it, including their machine that measured uh, the speed of light. So that's why they couldn't find it, is they assumed they made a false assumption. And here's a, a picture of, you know, the deastrofractation, like I said, the Lagrange point between the moon and the uh, earth is where spiraling ether starts spiraling in towards the earth on one side and it starts spiraling into the moon on the other side. And uh, this is, it holds true for any body in space or anything like that. It causes gravity and it causes rotation of the earth. And this implosive force really drives all the functions of nature. It keeps electrons in their orbit, uh, which would decay if they just uh, didn't have anything driving them and it causes magnetism and all that. We've only dealt with so far with the left-handed energy. There's actually four different waves in the ether, 
And uh, well, this is more on the deastrofractation here. As the vortices get closer to the ground, they'll break up. So every building has one, every person in that building has one, every molecule on that person's skin has one. So it's kind of like a backwards bullet hole. These vortexes come in and break up into smaller and smaller vortexes. And nothing could exist without this vortex of energy holding it together. And uh, as you see, every vortex uh, is around everything. There's basically 20 vortexes around uh, something in a sphere, but there could be more or less depending on the geometry of the object. And all the vortexes obey something called the golden mean. Uh, gravity accelerates stuff according to this uh, ratio, and it twists things according to this ratio too. You can't see the twist that gravity imparts to things because the twist only becomes evident on the nuclear level. On the uh, macro level, you only see the linear acceleration. You drop something, it goes one foot, one foot, two feet, three feet, five feet, eight feet, 13 feet, 21 feet, and it accelerates in that linear fashion in this Fibonacci series. But it also, the atoms are also being twisted at the same time. So there's two accelerations going on according to gravity, linear and rotational. And the Fibonacci series is um, what produces the golden mean. It's an additive series, one plus one is two, two plus one is three, then you get 5, 8, 13, 21, et cetera. And any two numbers divided, say 34 into 55, will give you 1.618, which is the golden mean. 55 into 34 will give you the golden mean minus 1, which is phi, which is 0 0.6181. So any section of the spiral going out is 1.6 times bigger and than the last 90 degrees, and any section of the spiral going in is 0.618 times as big as the spiral going out next to it. So it's a very interesting number, and everything in nature obeys the golden mean. The rotation on a ram's horns, uh, you see the spiral throughout uh, everywhere. Uh, nature, uh, plants, trees, uh, fish, uh, seashells, even the ratios of our um, bones and our fingers and our body obey this ratio, the golden mean ratio. The Greeks knew about it. They uh, constructed their architecture very much around it. And uh, it permeates nature, but nobody really knows why. And uh, this is to say that the golden mean resonates with phi very much. Phi being five. It's the reason we have five fingers, is because it resonates with the golden mean. And uh, any vortex has five sides to it. And I could do a whole series on how the golden mean and five fits into the five-sided pentagram. That's why the uh, magicians use a five-sided pentagram. An upright pentagram will attract the positive energy, the right-handed energy, and an upside-down pentagram will attract the evil, sinister energy. And there's a reason why right and left are good and bad in yin and yang in this uh, universe. And uh, I'll get to that in a second, but here are the four spirals. Uh, the first one is left in. That goes all the way down to the nuclear level. And then there's a right out that comes also back out from the nuclear level. That bounces around in the, uh, the, the cosmos and becomes, a, every time a right out wave hits something, it uh, bounces off and becomes a right-handed in wave, like it's uh, bouncing off a mirror, it becomes inflected. And then finally we have the left out wave also, which also comes out from the nuclear level. This is, um, well, I should get to this in a minute. This is why here, right is good and left is bad. Um, because the initial wave is left-handed inward, goes down to the nucleus of an atom, pushes that atom out of this universe through three adjacent universes. I have a slide on that in a second. And it comes back radiating out right-handed energy. Now that right-handed energy has to climb uphill against the imploding left-handed energy. And in doing so, it becomes smoother, it becomes more organized, and it becomes tighter. And it's better for keeping stuff together, organizing it, cooling stuff down, crystallizing things, and doing stuff like that, whereas the left-handed energy is looser and sloppier, and it tends to be centrifugal, while the right-handed energy is centripetal, pulls stuff together. Left-handed energy throws stuff apart. Uh, Right-handed energy pulls stuff together. So all your DNA, all DNA in all life forms, as a matter of fact, is a right-handed spiral. And um, that's why, you know, right is good because it promotes life. It keeps stuff together and uh, organizes stuff. Whereas left-handed energy is sinister and evil, tends to rip stuff apart and throw it apart. Um, 
going back, this is a little, I don't know, if John, can you play this now? This is a little video to demonstrate there's actually a vortex around all magnets that is this imploding ether. Hello, this is Al, a.k.a. Magnet Flipper on YouTube. Magnetic flux spin validation. This little video that I made basically shows, in fact, conclusive proof that magnets generate a helical vortex, a tornado type of a magnetic field that is unknown to science. What I have here is basically a magnet, a chrome-plated neodymium magnet sitting in water, sitting on a metal plate with a little tiny insulator that's sitting on. And what I do is I basically apply a voltage to the side of the magnet, okay, inducing a, a helical vortex like a miniature tornado, basically through the gas bubbles that are being generated by the electricity. And it's inducing this magnetic flux to be shown uh, by the frame, uh, called flame, frame dragging of the, of the bubbles. It's absolutely incredible. This is, I don't think you're going to see this anywhere on YouTube. This is actually conclusive proof that, in fact, there's another field that magnets produce uh, that is unknown to science that can be actually shown and generated with a very simple and expensive method. This is, looks like a tornado being generated like, a, like, a, like huge tornadoes, but it's being generated by purely uh, by by purely electrical means. Here is, uh, this is basically rot rotating uh, counterclockwise. The other video was uh, clip was showing clockwise rotation. Uh, it's absolutely incredible. And uh, I hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll be able to duplicate this. It's basically a very simple electrolyzer uh, that can show this effect. Here, I reverse the polarity of the magnet. I flipped it upside down, and I apply a voltage to it. When I apply a voltage, the helical field is basically spinning clockwise in this area. And um, I have a uh, description of why this, uh, this is shown. Uh, it goes back to the 1980s to, an, to a man named Howard Johnson. This is an iron slug here to show to my critics that, in fact, that uh, the helical field is generated by a magnetic field as opposed to a left and right hand rule of current flow through the wire. You can see that there is no helical spin. This iron slug is the same size and the weight as the neodymium magnet, and there is no helical spin at all. So this is to all my critics saying that, in fact, this is being generated by a... Uh, magnetic field flow through the wire. This basically here will, uh, will show, in fact, that you can actually do some incredible uh, discoveries based upon this uh, unknown field, uh, probably for, from anti-gravity to free energy to uh, faster, better motors, also to weather phenomenon. I mean, look at this. What you have here is basically a tornado that's being generated on top of a magnet. You can study this in slow motion. You can add particles to it, and you have a tornado that you can actually generate right off the bat. And uh, the science is virtually unaware that this magnetic field actually exists. I've never seen this anywhere on YouTube or any type of an explanation of how this happens. This is a slow motion view, and this is about 210 frames that shows, in fact, the bottom of the magnet being uh, generated like in the tornado, and the bubbles begin to form. They're being uh, pulled by the magnetic field uh, as this thing is spinning. And uh, you're going to have a nice, beautiful tornado on top of that. I call it a magnetic vortex. And if you do a search in magnetic vortex, the only thing that's out there is that was discovered by the Germans at the University of Munich in uh, January of this year. And basically, it's revolutionary what they discovered. This only validates the fact that you can actually have a uh, helical spin. And I'm suspecting that the helical spins are everywhere. They're underpinning of the part of the universe that, uh, that, uh, that scientists is talking about. Uh, based upon the devices that you can make upon this is uh, basically healing devices. You can, you can generate a tremendous amount of storage in, uh, in memory cores, in, in memory cards for computers, faster processors, bigger and more powerful motors. 
And uh, application is just endless. This is really shocking that you can actually induce a magnetic field spin like this in a magnet. Now, I'm not sure if this magnet is, in fact, causing the field or if it is a field that is generated, that is, that is basically made by the magnet and that's not, uh, that's not seen by conventional iron filings and uh, flux as conventional science has us believing that, in fact, it's a static field. This is really a dynamic field. I'm going to let you watch this a little bit more, and uh, please read the captions toward the end of the video because they're extremely, they're extremely important. Thank you. Thank you for watching this video. Please read the captions at the end. All right. <clears throat> well, I mean, that goes to show there is a field around everything. Uh, because everything has some magnetism to it. But he was mistaken when he said the magnet generates the field. The field goes into the magnet. The field is always there. The magnet just attracts one half of the field more than the other. The negative half of the magnet applies to the left-handed field, and the positive side of the magnet attracts the right-handed side. And that's what these coils attempt to do, is derive, separate the waves in the ether and pull more of the right-handed waves in and channel them and use them more. And as you'll see, I have a demonstration later using the coil where it actually promotes uh, the growth of plants. And I think it can be used in healing processes and uh, agricultural processes and all kinds of processes. There's a guy named Dan Winter who has um, a device called the imploder, which is basically a left-handed nozzle that you put on the end of a hose. And it accelerates water in a left-handed golden mean spiral. He sprays it on crops. And you think, well, left-handed, oh, that's not good. That's not going to promote life. But what happens is because left-handed energy loosens things up, it reduces the surface tension of the water. And it allows the water to be absorbed by the crops a lot more easily and more readily than conventional water. And because of this, he has uh, on his website, he's got a beautiful website concerning, he's another present-day scientist that's working on this stuff. He's got a beautiful website that has pictures of uh, plant growth um, due to this vortex nozzle, very simple, Newtonian, you know, non-magnetic, non-electronic device. It's just a simple plastic nozzle that's increasing crop yield by like 10% all over the world. And that's a lot if you think about it, you know, over time and energy. That could really save a lot of energy and feed a lot of people. A lot of different scientists over the years have... Um, known about this vortex energy. Wilhelm Reich was one of them. Um, my dad was the, the host of the Today Show. He actually took a news crew down to the New York Library where they covered the book burning of Wilhelm Reich. He actually had his books burned on the steps of the New York Library back in the 50s. And um, you know about this. Huh? Yeah, that was a, a true Nazi book burning by Wilhelm Reich. Then they threw the poor guy in jail where he died because they denied him his heart condition medicine. And so this kind of stuff was very controversial back in the day. I think the powers that be are starting to loosen up on this kind of technology um, because there's a gentleman out in the lobby that just patented an over-unity device. And I asked him, did they come after you or have you gotten any death threats or anything? He said, no, nope, went right through. I think the powers that be are understanding that this kind of technology has to be now utilized or else they will not have a planet to be greedy on. So I think this kind of technology is more and more coming to the forefront and people are less afraid to explore it and patent it and uh, put it to use. Uh, this is what happens at the nuclear center of an atom. I think they've known this a long time, they just don't talk about it. The left-handed energy goes inward and it spins the nucleus of the atom faster and faster and faster. And it adds more and more wobble to the nucleus so that eventually any point on the nucleus of the atom would be seen to be moving faster than light from one side of the nucleus to the other as it spins faster and faster. This would prove to be a paradox, and nature doesn't like paradoxes,
So the particle shrinks and gets smaller and smaller and smaller as it's accelerated faster and faster and faster around and around. You don't have to accelerate something in a linear fashion to have it go faster than light. You can rotate it faster than light. You just keep adding more accelerations on the x, y, and z axes continuously, and pretty soon it's rotating so fast that it's actually rotating, uh, the surface is rotating faster than light. And it will shrink right down to the Planck length and disappear out of our universe, where it then travels through three other universes. Universes actually come in tetrahedral sets. Um, there's another gentleman out there who is uh, the guy I just referred to doing the over-unity um, work that we were talking about subspace or hyperspace yesterday. And that's part of his design in his equipment is a lot of equipment is now using the existence of alternate universes, universes that abut ours to uh, function. Quantum computing would not exist if it wasn't for the actual existence of a universe next door where we can control the data. And um, other devices are coming out, um, over unity devices and whatnot that are actually, there's also um, evidence that virtual particles pop into this universe, they stay here a little while and then they leave. And uh, they never quite completely materialize in this universe because they're, they spend most of their time in other universes. And that's what's actually happening with all the, the matter in this room. It's only here half the time. The rest of the time, it's somebody else's desk. It's somebody else's shoe. It's somebody else's being. And um, it's hard to distinguish this because it happens so quickly. It happens like 600 billion times a second that uh, matter rotates through these universes. But... They're out there, and um, you hate to even think about it because it gives you a headache. I'd rather just think about what goes on in this universe, but you can't really deal with what goes on in this universe unless you look at the functioning of other universes. And uh, this is to say that these imploding ether waves is what actually causes inertia. Uh, Einstein kind of knew this. He knew that inertia and gravity were completely related and had... Um, mathematics to show the relationship, but he didn't know why. He didn't understand really what gravity was or what inertia is. It's just that when you move an object, you're creating a high pressure zone against the ether waves on one side and a low pressure zone on the other side, and it takes a minute for the ether waves to stabilize. So that's the resistance in the space-time continuum that causes inertia. And uh, I'm getting to the point where I'll, I'll explain how these coils and how these sanding surfaces attract energy and um, how they can then utilize energy. Uh, this is more of a, a rotational momentum converter, but I'll explain it real quick because it has to do with compounding accelerations. I think the next one is no. This has to do with the figure eight in the coil. But Newton said that if an object is in orbit around the Earth, for instance, or it's traveling in a circle, it's not constantly at the same rate. It's under constant acceleration. Although it, it is traveling at the same velocity, it's constantly changing direction. In order to be constantly changing direction, it has to be under constant acceleration. And uh, that's how this linear momentum converter would work. It would pull weights in along the armature of a spinning wheel so that the weights on one side of the wheel are very close to the rotation at the center and they have very little centrifugal force trying to fly away and the weights on the other side of the rotation are far away, they're allowed to fall out, and they have a lot of centrifugal force wanting to fly away. So as you spin the wheel faster and faster and pull the weights in and let them out, the weights are not only under constant acceleration around and around, but they're going in and out and in and out, and that's a secondary constant acceleration, which um, allows it to overcome gravity, allows it to overcome inertia. And uh, in a way, that's what these figure eight coils do. They accelerate something in more than two dimensions. As this um, linear momentum converter does, it accelerates a heavy half of a disk in all three dimensions. You're spinning around a disk, and you spin it on the x-axis, you spin it on the y-axis, and you spin it on the z-axis. So now you have three constant accelerations going, and this added to the heavy side of a mass makes it so it never reaches the southern hemisphere and all the centrifugal vectors add up to go one way. Now this can cause anti-gravity or rotational to linear momentum conversion, as in this machine, but on the other hand, it works the other way too. The gravity waves come in and they push around electrons in this coil in all three dimensions, and that electron is spun. 
more and more and more, and it, it uh, radiates EMF. And so the gravity is actually being turned by means of this technique into electromagnetic force. You can use this in the opposite way and turn gravity into force. So I'll skip over this pretty much because it's not in the uh, tensor coil um, family, but it does describe how a uh, rotating something in three dimensions can form a figure eight which will concentrate the linear um, direction of momentum. And uh, again, the figure eight can be used to um, actually drive an anti-gravity um, spaceship, for instance. Um, if you drag around the north pole of an atom in the figure eight that this coil drags around electrons in, it will tend to want to move in the one direction. And that might be useful in UFOs or whatever. And uh, here's the part where, as I said, Newton says something in constant orbit is under constant acceleration. But if you were to have a vehicle hover over the Earth for the same amount of time it takes a satellite to uh, travel around the Earth once, that vehicle would reach light speed. Or it, it would spend enough money, uh, energy-wise, to reach light speed in the time it takes a satellite to go around the Earth. So this um, pulls together space and time and rotation into uh, our continuum. And it defines our continuum in terms of rotation, time, momentum, gravity, and all that good stuff. Now, this is something I need to harp on for a minute because it's what these coils are all about. You're adding acceleration onto acceleration onto acceleration. You start with uh, just a straight line. This is, a, you know, one acceleration. Then you have a circle. Then what you do is you bend the circle. So you have something going around and around, and it's going up and down as the bend in the circle takes place. Just as these uh, coils are bent figure eights, so they're going around the figure eight, but the, the electron is also going up and down at the same time. Then you would flip over the, uh, the bent circle into a figure eight. So it's not only going around and around and up and down, but it's going back and forth. It starts right-handed, then it has to change direction and go left-handed, which is another constant acceleration. Then you make one side of the figure eight big and you make one small. So it's going the first four accelerations and it's also going in on one side and out on the other side. And in on one side and out on the other side. Yet another constant acceleration. And you do this three times, you make it uh, shrink three times, and then you make it get bigger three times. That's another constant acceleration. So finally you wind up with something that looks like this coil, which is like a bent three-decker four-leaf clover. Um, the first three coils are bent downwards, 72 degrees. And then it takes a 90 degree left turn and it's bent upwards 72 degrees on each level. So you're, you're getting all the different rotations possible on an XYZ axis. And you have 13 really constant accelerations all bent together. And this is what happens with the, um, the ether waves. There's so many waves going on, there's so many accelerations, that if you can accelerate your electron in all 13 dimensions, if you will, that's when you start being able to resonate with the waves. And you do so in something called um, harmonic resonance or sympathetic resonance. If you have a guitar string and you tune it to E, you have another guitar string next to it and you tune that to E, when you pluck the first one, the second one will also resonate and uh, vibrate, just like the first one. So that's sympathetic resonance, and that's what these coils attempt to do, is sympathetically resonate with the different waves coming in and out. There are four different waves, right in, right out, left in, left out, and there's three sets of each of those waves. So there's actually 12 waves, like 12 hours on a clock, and um, these tensor coils address all 12 waves. And um, this is what scalar waves are all about, too. So what you're doing by shrinking the figure eights and then expanding the figure eights, you're making the wave go faster, 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 and then slower, 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 faster, faster. So if you accelerate something faster and then slower, and then faster and then slower, that's also equal to a constant acceleration. You're speeding it up and you're slowing it down. It doesn't have to have a spatial um, reference in that case. You can just have it go up and down faster or side to side faster and slower and faster and slower. Uh, it's got to go both ways, though. Decelerating something is just as much as a acceleration as accelerating something to an observer. And we don't usually think of acceleration in that way, but 
It's true. So the more waves you can put inside of more waves, the more accelerations you're going to get. That's why there are fractal patterns that go into these coils, which I'll get to in a minute here, that you have to, as you make the coil, you not only make the leaf of the coil in a certain shape that resonates with phi, but as you do so, you have to twist the coil in a certain pattern, which will help resonate with these waves. And uh, they're difficult to make. They take quite a while because you have, to, you have to be very patient and twist them in just the right way and then make sure they're the right shape and then they'll bend out of shape because you're always against the ether grain, if you will. So you have to constantly fight this ether wind to get them in the right shape. And here's a video we can skip. It's just kind of a comic video. Now we're getting to the coil here uh, that is attempting to resonate with these waves. The first half of the coil, I guess I can draw this out later. Can I, can I display this and then go back to the, uh, or should I do this first and then display later? Okay. Yeah, I'll go back to the, uh, there we go. I'll go back to it in a minute here. The coil basically is a wire that comes down and then you start a right-handed loop like so and it is bent downward and then a left-handed loop. Now the left-handed loop is going to be 10% bigger than the right-handed loop because as I said the right-handed waves are smaller and tighter. Ah. Thank you. The right-handed waves are smaller and tighter than the left-handed waves. And um, so the right-handed wave is going to be a little bit more compact. And by doing so, you have 144 degrees of rotation of the phi spiral on this side of the loop. This side is going clockwise and downward and inward. So at the end of the loop, the rotation is much more severe than at the beginning of the loop. So this is 144 degrees of the spi phi spiral worth of rotation. Then the electron, so you're, you're surfing a right-handed inward wave going down. Then at the end of the loop, the electron is going to jump into a different wave, which is a right-handed outbound wave going upward. And it will travel all the way to the end here. Again, you have another 144 degrees of rotation of phi. And you also, during this time, you also, the entire loop is bent 36 degrees on each side worth of phi rotation. So it goes down 36 degrees and it goes up 36 degrees. That way you have a full 360 worth of right-handed rotation on this side. And again, on this side you have 36 degrees bent down, uh, a total of 72 degrees, which is one side of a phi, uh, you know, five-sided pentagram. And uh, everything resonates with phi. And that's the idea is to resonate with these phi waves and surf these waves. So now you've got a left-handed in wave going down here, you're surfing. And here it jumps to a left-handed out wave, decreasing in uh, severity as far as rotation. And you're surfing this wave. Then it drops down. And again, uh, to compound an acceleration, your, your next loop will be one phi measure shorter. So if this loop here is going to be eight units long on this side, it would be 8.8, 10% longer on the left side here, and you would drop down, and the next loop would be five units, the Fibonacci number less, or a phi golden ratio less uh, long. So this would be five inches worth of loop, and this would be 5.5 inches worth of loop. And again, you have the same 144, 144, uh, 72 degrees, so you have another two full rotations. And then finally at the very bottom, you would have 8, 5, and then 3. And then so you get 3.3 .3 on this side. And you would have a very small loop, a slightly bigger loop. Then you would go 90 degrees out of phase and stay left-handed, make another left-handed loop, and then a right-handed loop here. And these are 90 degrees out of phase, but these are bent upward like that. So these are designed to catch another set of waves, one radiating out from underneath the coil. And again, this would be left, right, and then left, 
right here. And then it either goes back into the loop. Um, you, end, you start right and you end right. All your tensors have to begin right and end right. Otherwise, they'll fall apart or you'll bleed out energy or bad things will happen. They'll, um, they'll twist out of shape. They won't work. Um, it's important to start right and end right. And whatever you do, if you're making these coils or these surfaces or experimenting with this geometry in any way, make sure you do not do it near compressed gas or gasoline or car batteries or anything like that because you are attracting energy and things will get hot and spontaneously combust. I've uh, had a lot of strange experiments. Some I won't even talk about because I can't replicate them or I haven't been able to replicate them yet. And they're just too weird to talk about. But um, I have learned to take this very seriously and always start and end right clockwise uh, wise. Uh, relative to the direction of gravity, that's the, you know, the clockwise that I'm talking about. It always has to be relative to up and down. So always start your tensors right and end them right. And as you end this one right, you can either put the electrons back into the loop if they're not accelerated enough, or by the time the electron makes this entire circuit, it'll be rotating so fast, it'll want to leave this continuum, but rather than do so, it'll be radiating EMF. And um, if your loop here, if your tire coil is superconducting, then you're talking about cleaning free energy from the ether. You would have to be a superconducting coil. Uh, I haven't been able to make one yet. But if it was, then you would actually have real electrons traveling the entire loop. If it's not superconducting, you're only getting charge, which jumps from electron to electron, traveling the loop. And you might get some free energy out of this, but um, not really enough to power a house or something. If it was superconducting, you'd get a lot of energy out of this. So, now how do I go back to the uh, presentation? So this is just the, the first part of the loop, right, left, right, left. And it shows the downward bent first um, coil and upward bent second coil. Uh-oh. Doesn't seem to be working, John. Doesn't seem to be clicking here. Okay. Yeah, that's better. <coughs> okay. Um, so you have right, left, down, right, left, down, right, left, down, then left, right, up, left, right, up, left, right, up. And that transmits into what you can make out of solder. Now, these coils are all made out of non-ferrous material. The solder I use is either um, aluminum or tin, or aluminum and tin, or I've got one up here that's uh, strictly aluminum. I mean lead and tin, and I also use aluminum, but they are non-ferrous materials but yet you can detect the fields, the energy fields around something. I would ask you guys to come up and try to dangle these coils. Let me uh, see if I can do that here. And uh, see if you can feel the effect. I mean, that's what it, I enjoy showing people. Do you have a glass of water I could drink? Cool. So um, I have this symbol too, which uh, has some effects, but I would ask you guys to come up here and try to dangle this off the end of your finger and I have wood here, which is really the best conductor of energy because it's uh, right-handed energy, and water. And I would hope that you would walk it across the floor like this. I've had people call it the invisible dog leash because you can feel like, it's, like you're dragging it through syrup sometimes. And uh, it detects pipes underneath the floor. You can feel it twist and turn. And it looks funny, but it's, it's quite an interesting effect because it does detect the edges of things very well where these uh, ether fields exist. And one field bleeds into another. Thank you. And uh, any takers? Anybody want to try checking these out? My friend uh, Cameron Rebusall is here, and um, I was able to show this to him. 
last year at the NPA, National Philosophical Association. And he inspired me because I was able to show him. He came all the way from Washington down to Los Angeles to have me show him how to make one. And I spent an afternoon showing him. And after he was able to successfully make one, that's what inspired me to do this workshop. I thought, wow, if I can show him, I can show everybody. And I figured I want to show the world what these are and how they're made because um, I spent a long time figuring this out. <laughs> and even though I haven't really found any commercial application for this, I find the aesthetic beauty of it really touching and I uh, enjoy showing these to people. So if you'd like to hold it near the edges of things, you can kind of feel a little pull and push. Well, copper or gold would really be the best. If I could afford it, I'd make one out of gold. Would you like to dangle? <laughs> Yeah, I made one, I made, um, actually I made one out of copper tubing once and I ran water through it. And uh, I couldn't find it for this demonstration. Plus it would have been a real pain in the neck to set up outside. But when I ran water through it, the interesting thing was that when I ran water through it with the right-handed loop first, the water came out eventually in a very smooth laminar flow. But when I ran water through it with the left-handed loop starting, it came out all sputtery and chaotic. And I thought that's interesting because in calculus, your curve, no matter what it does, is always subject to how it begins. If it begins in a positive way, it'll be positive throughout the entire trajectory. And it's the same with these coils. If you start the coil right-handed, you'll get right-handed energy. If you start it left-handed, it'll, it'll cause chaos and disruption and stuff. And like I said, I've had all real close calls messing with left-handed energy because it is sinister and tricky and, you know... <laughs> the devil's hand or whatever you want to call it. You know, I don't mess with it more than I have to. Um, well, I haven't got to the fractal patterns yet, so I'll, I'll get to those. And uh, here, you want to try a different one? Because they're all a little different. This is lighter. This is the aluminum one here. Yeah, I'm thinking about it. I might as well, you know, so I can, I can legitimize that it's... Uh, well, I mean, you're understanding that it resonates with the waves and it captures some of that energy of the waves. That's really all it is. It. No. Right, it's neither of the, the above. Yeah, it's the original primal, they call it piranha or chi or the force or um, uh, what, did, what did William Wright call it? You know, uh, orgone energy. It's orgone, yeah, orgone energy. And uh, he was able to build boxes uh, using this principle back in the day that actually captured this energy. And the inside of the box would get hot because he was able to capture these waves. And this pendant I have on right now, just by chance, also captures orgone energy uh, through scalar waves. I didn't make this. I bought this off somebody. And um, it's quite remarkable, though, because it increases your balance. The, the guy that sold this to me said... Uh, here, let's try this. And he held my hand, and he said, lift your foot. And he gently pulled me off balance. And I go, okay, so. And then he said, put this on. And I put this on, and we repeated the experiment, and he couldn't pull me off balance the second time. So, so it, uh, it, it, this is weird. I'm not sure how this works either. I'm embarrassed. I mean, I work with this energy, but I'm not sure who designed this or exactly how this works. Because it's very simple. It just has a couple of gems at a certain ratio and but it does I can tell you it attracts right-handed energy because that's the the energy of balance if you get the right-handed energy going it'll 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 focus things and, and balance them left-handed energy will make them fall apart and fall over and whatnot but um, really wow cool I'm gonna have to make one <laughs> really it's just like copper layers of copper and insulation and stuff like that all right. Did you feel anything? Yeah. Who's the one? Cool. It doesn't matter. Yeah, any way that works, you know. Some people feel it better than others, and, you know, some people don't feel it. So I think it has a lot to do with your own energy field, too. I'm not sure about that, you know. 
Really, huh? Huh, interesting. Well, let me move on to the fractal patterns that I use making these. Because they're, they're more complicated than just the geometry that I've gone into up here. If you make them just in the, in the geometry of the loops, you'll probably get some effect. But the best thing to do is when you make them, and I'll start making one up here, is to um, incorporate these, oh, excuse me, incorporate these loops, uh, these, these rotations into the loops. This is an experiment I did with uh, lentils and uh, the life force, I guess you could call it. Um, I put two jars of lentils side by side. One's the control group and one's a group of sprouting lentils with the coil next to it. And over time, you can see the jar with the lentils um, with the coil next to it sprouted beefier and thicker and heavier than the control group. And not a great deal, but a noticeable deal. Maybe 10%. And uh, this is exciting, because I think if you even put these coils in a, an aqueduct or ran water over them, um, you could get that effect. And uh, this is another superluminal effect. Uh, if you build something in the shape of this coil, like a magnetic accelerator, and you spin the, ro you spin the north pole of an electron or an atom in this pattern, Right, left, right, left, right, faster and faster, and then slower and slower, and then faster and faster, slower and slower, out of phase. Eventually, you will accelerate the atom as happens in nature. The natural ether waves will accelerate a nucleus or an atom right out of this continuum. You can do that artificially by employing the geometry of these coils to an atom in an electromagnetic accelerator. So this would actually probably be interdimensional travel or... Uh, you know, warp drive, as they put it. Uh, this would accelerate your spaceship or whatever is under the magnetic accelerator uh, faster and faster till it reached the speed of light without a linear acceleration. It would be all rotational acceleration, and it would have to leave this time-space. It would pop up some other when and some other where. And um, here's the beginning of what determines the fractal patterns that uh, I'm so fond of that I had to skip over a lot last year because I didn't have enough time or when I was here last. Uh, what I figured is, if you look at the spiral, if you're taking a shower and you look at the spiral of water going down the drain in the shower, you'll notice oftentimes there are little spokes radiating out from the, uh, the center of the uh, drain and the water spiraling in. But these spokes radiate out and they st they're standing waves. They stay in one place. And you can splash these waves and they'll go away for a second, but they'll come back in the same place. And these waves are where the water gets ahead of itself, it travels a little too fast for its viscosity, and then it bunches up, and it makes a standing wave. And then it loosens up again and travels faster, faster, and then it bunches up again, and makes another standing wave. And um, that has to do with the viscosity and the, the phase shifting, if you will, of the travel of the water. Now I figured, how do you figure out where these spokes are in the ether waves? So I kind, of, I kind of took a bunch of guesses, and uh, this was one mathematical process I came up to graph where the waves are and how to resonate with these little spikes and the, the resonance in the ether waves themselves. So it's not enough just to resonate with the shape of the wave. You want to resonate with the acceleration and the deceleration happening within the wave itself, and you'll get even more energy out of it in the long run. And so what I figured is you take a, a five-sided pentagram again, and the average rotation of, um, just like gravity accelerates something 32 feet per second per second in a linear downward way, I figured that the ether had to be twisting stuff about 72 degrees per second per second as it accelerates it. So this would happen on the atomic level. You can't see this on the uh, macro level because all the waves kind of even out on the macro level. But on the atomic level, the, the atoms are being accelerated around and around as well as uh, straight down. Anyway, you take a five-sided uh, pentagram and you accelerate it 72 degrees, and then the next second you would, that would be 1.618 times 72, which would be about 108 degrees, and the third second would be about 180 degrees. Um, so you're, every second you go 72 degrees times 1618, 
Um, and then the next second would be that number times 1618. And every time the wheel completes 360 degrees rotation, it flips over and you see the black side. So for the first three seconds of acceleration, you're looking at the white side of the wheel. That would be one full phase shift. Then it flips over and you're looking at the black side of the wheel for, because it's traveling faster and faster, you're only going to see the black side of the wheel for one second. And then it'll flip over again and you'll see the white side of the wheel because now the wheel's going around many degrees of 72 degrees. It's, it's probably traveling three times around and you'll only see it one second on the white side. So really what you're doing is just sampling the side of the wheel, what side it's on, black or white, as it continues to accelerate a la the golden mean acceleration, 72 degrees per second per second basically is what it is. And this will give you a pattern of the phase shifting and where the spokes are in the waves in the ether. And this is the pattern um, for right and left because as I said, you can squeeze more rotation into a right-handed circle, more information into a right-handed circle or spiral than you can a left-handed circle because it's tighter, it's more organized, and it's denser. It'll hold more information.